Uh, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Um, good morning and welcome to the Bipartisan Policy Center. I'm sorry we're running just a little bit late. We'll try to catch up here. Uh, I'm Bill Hoagland, with, uh, a senior vice president here with the center. Uh, let me say at the outset that uh, how pleased I am to see this many people here. Uh, but also express some surprise a little bit that uh, so many of you would take time out of your schedules to uh, what is likely to be a rather wonky discussion about modeling health insurance, so thank you for your willingness to come out. For those of you who do not know, uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center was established about 11 years ago by uh, four former majority leaders of the United States Senate. Uh, Senator uh, Bob Dole, uh, the late Senator Howard Baker on the Republican side, Senator George Mitchell, and Tom Daschle on the Democratic side. Over my uh, career working in Congress, I had the pleasure and honor as a Senate staffer to have worked with all four of those individuals. And I can say, well, they clearly had different uh, solutions to the policy challenges they confronted. Uh, they nonetheless uh, respected, if not always agreed, with the independent analysis uh, provided to them by the Congressional Budget Office. And that, unfortunately, from my perspective, is I've not seen over the last few years, and, to, and partly because as, a, as the bitter uh, partisan debate has unfolded uh, over the Affordable Care Act, putting CBO in the crosshairs. And that concerns me, not just as one who was an original alumni of that organization uh, back uh, when Alice Rivlin was the first director uh, in the late 1970s, because I'm one who believes in the agencies. I'll put my biases on the table here at the outset. Uh, but as a citizen uh, who believes that Congress needs, sometimes now more than ever in this era of so-called fake news, the independent analysis of CBO to provide con Congress with what it needs to conduct its business. If you will, for just a second here, entertain an old uh, budget analyst for a minute. When I was at CBO in the early and late 70s, I was responsible for estimates associated with the then called the food stamp program, now the SNAP program. I was much younger, not long out of graduate courses in statistics. I had my little regression model that, uh, with a very high R square and uh, values and for estimating participation and cost in that program. And I was asked to go explain to uh, Senator Hubert Humphrey, who was then the ranking member on the Senate Ag Committee, about the estimates that I was producing for them. I explained to him that the estimates of participation had a standard error of the estimate. So the cost could range between A and B. The senator looked at me and he said, uh, son, we don't appropriate in ranges. We appropriate a number. Uh, I tell you that story uh, not only because it's true, but because uh, modeling any major public program, but particularly something as complex and difficult as our healthcare system, will always have a standard error of the estimate. It will always have uncertainty. It will never be perfect. And I believe Director Hall and Jessica and Alex here today will confirm that. But that doesn't mean that uh, we shouldn't try to present the best estimates that they can provide to Congress, and that would be, that is necessary for, if not, it would be even a more, from my perspective, an even more dysfunctional Congress. So today we are pleased that CBO has chosen BPC as the venue for presenting an update in the development of their health insurance simulation model. I learned the acronym HISIM 2.0, if you like. And this is not about CBO's past estimates of health insurance, though I assume there will be questions about how this new model uh, compares or could uh, compare to the past estimates that CBO has produced. This is about CBO improving its past health insurance model. It's about being transparent in the process and, and their willingness to accept input uh, from, uh, from 
groups such as this we're having today from you. Uh, Jessica Bantham uh, is the Deputy Assistant Director of the Health, Retirement, and Long-Term Analysis Division. And Alex Minicosi, uh, Unit Chief Health Insurance Modeling, will present this their update. Once they have uh, completed their presentation, uh, Jessica and Alex will leave the stage briefly. And Gail Walensky, um, a co-chair here with BPC's ongoing Future of Healthcare program, will moderate a panel critiquing the CPO model development. Finally, when Gail is finished, uh, panel is finished, Jessica, Alex, and the director, Keith Hall, will join them on stage for your questions and seek your input. I should note just in passing that our Future of Healthcare program that I mentioned uh, at BPC includes a group of health policy analysts, what I like to call the Big Ten, five Republicans, five Democrats, along with Gail co-chairing with uh, the project is, uh, is with uh, Senator Daschle, uh, my last boss on the Hill, Senator Frist, and Andy Slavitt, and other members um, include those here joining us today, which are Chris Jennings, Ovik Roy, Jim Capretta, who are also on that uh, uh, Big Ten group. So without further ado, Jessica, Alex, take it away. Thank you, Bill. Um, good morning, everyone. It's great to be here. Uh, this morning, Alex and I are going to tell you about CBO's health insurance simulation model, HISIM for short. Uh, before I begin, I want to make clear that our talk today is focused on the new HISIM that we are still in the process of developing and testing. Uh, the new model has not yet been put to use. Uh, in the spirit of greater transparency, we are presenting an overview of our new model while it is still in the development and testing phase so that we can solicit reaction and feedback. We will not use, um, so uh, just to clarify, we did not use the new HISIM to develop the baseline projections that were published just a month ago on May 23rd, 2018. For those projections, we used our current model, also known as HISIM. So uh, for today's talk, I'll refer to that as HISIM 1.0, um, but I'm, my focus is on HISIM 2.0. Um, <clears throat> These slides, by the way, have been posted, um, next slide, uh, uh, on the CBO website if you'd like to look at them later. Next slide. Uh, what is HISIM used for? We use HISIM to generate estimates of insurance coverage. The model estimates distributions by the most important sources of coverage, including employment-based coverage, Medicaid, marketplace, non-group coverage outside the marketplace, and the uninsured. The model also generates estimates of private insurance premiums. The focus is on the population under 65. CBO uses the model to do <coughs> two very important things. It helps develop baseline projections, which are based on current law. It is also used to help develop cost estimates for proposed policies that would have an effect on insurance coverage. That is proposals uh, re regarding the ACA or to replace the ACA. <clears throat> Next slide. Uh, how does CBO use HISIM to estimate the cost of proposals affecting health insurance coverage? To set the context for our new model, I'm going to first review the process that we follow in developing a cost estimate. This is a multi-step process, and it's the same whether we're using our current model or our new model. Um, I will review each of these steps in detail, but uh, as you can see from the flow chart, HISIM is just one of several major models that we use in the process of developing a cost estimate. HISIM plays a very important role for sure, but a cost estimate is completed only by uh, combining its output with other model outputs. <clears throat> So step one, the first step in developing a cost estimate is to develop a modeling strategy. 
Um, CBO and JCT staff read the legislative language of the proposal and we note how it would change current law. We identify how the proposal would affect the federal budget and how it would affect coverage. We project how states might respond to the proposal. We also identify what regulations and infrastructure would be needed in place in order to implement the proposal. Finally, we consider how quickly stakeholders would respond to the proposal and how those changes, how those responses might change over time. The second step is to analyze the proposal in HISIM. HISIM estimates changes in coverage in response to the proposal. HISIM models how individuals and employers respond to changes in relative price and generosity of various health insurance options. The model incorporates a wide range of information drawn from administrative and survey data uh, about a representative sample of individuals and family. So the information that's included in our model is that includes income, employment status, coverage status, as well as health status. <clears throat> in using HISIM, analysts first set um, the values for variables based on the proposal's specifications. For example, if a proposal changes the subsidy or the tax penalties or plans characteristics, we model that directly by changing variables in HISIM. An example would be if the eligibility for an income-based subsidy were to change or the size of that subsidy were to change, or if an income-based subsidy were replaced by a flat subsidy not related to income. We would put those variables right in the model. So HISIM models how individuals and employers make coverage choices. Um, but that's not the end of the story. CBO and JCT must then additionally account for various complex aspects of the model regarding state behavior, the timing of individual and employer responses, and uh, very important, insurer participation and market stability. So market stability is modeled separately from HISIM. Uh, CBO and JCT use economic theory, historical evidence, of which there is much, the academic literature, and consultations with outside experts to evaluate the likelihood that insurers would participate in the non-group market under a proposal. Um, we often do extensive consultations. We integrate the results of those assessments of insurer participation with the results from HISIM. In some cases, the proposal may include changes that would make stability of the marketplace uncertain. In that case, we incorporate that information into our projection of premiums, lower participation by insurers as a result of uncertainty uh, leads to less competition, and that has been shown to lead to higher premiums. Um, we also consider whether HISIM's results show that premiums for certain groups would enter an unsustainable spiral or lead to market failure. Uh, just to define market failure, um, what we're talking about is uh, when premiums go up and up um, and people um, leave the market. In the end, the people left in the market who are willing to purchase a plan have high health care costs such that an insurer would not be willing to offer the plan. Step three, <clears throat> review HISIM's output. Um, HISIM's output consists of changes in coverage and changes in premiums. CBO and JCT staff usually examine the changes in coverage by income, cell, and by source of coverage. A dozen or more analysts review the output. This is a quality control process. We review the output for a representative year, and then we look at the output over the 10-year projection period. Um, HISIM's output uh, does not represent the final estimate. Uh, sometimes HISIM is not well suited to model certain complex aspects of certain proposals, in which case we develop other models. Um, and then the proposal's budgetary effects are modeled uh, using Medicaid and tax models.
<coughs> Step four, we analyze the proposal's effects on Medicaid costs. Um, <coughs> CBO's Medicaid cost and coverage model uses HISAM output to determine the proposal's budgetary effects on Medicaid. It does so on the basis of an analysis of historical per capita spending. Step five, we analyze the proposal in JCT's tax models. Subsidies for coverage purchased through the non-group um, and, empl and employment-based markets, as well as penalties associated with the individual and employer mandates, are implemented through the Internal Revenue Code, as you know. JCT uses its tax models to determine how the changes in coverage and premiums produced by HISIM would affect tax liability. Uh, examples include changes in the total cost of premium tax credits for eligible taxpayers who are purchasing coverage in the marketplace, um, and changes in the share of employees' compensation that is taxable, resulting from changes in the number who are enrolled in health insurance through their employer. <clears throat> Uh, finally, step six, we write and review the formal estimate. All cost estimates go through extensive internal review by a group of analysts, senior staff, and managers from CBO and JCT. The review ensures that the final point estimates represent the middle of the distribution. That's what we're aiming for. Uh, we strive to write a clear explanation of the proposal's net budgetary effects and the effects on coverage and premiums. We try to make the estimate accessible by providing context, uh, explaining technical terms, and using tables, graphs, and figures as much as possible. Uh, but CBO and JCT do not make recommendations. OK, so what's the new high sim about? Um, so first of all, why update our model? Um, well, we, the new model is responding to continued congressional interest in understanding the effects of legislative proposals that significantly change health insurance coverage. We're incorporating new data into early stages of the modeling process. We are uh, better accounting for consumers' selections of types of plans. And we are also allowing for easier simulation of new insurance products. The new model, as I said, is a de in development and testing phase. So what uh, new data are we incorporating into HISIM? The new model's base data are from the current population survey, CPS, and were collected in years after the implementation of the Affordable Care Act. Currently, the, model, the new model is based on data from 2015. We're also incorporating uh, tax data tax data on the earnings of employees within firms. Uh, we have access to um, uh, records from the W-2 that are linked to uh, data from Form 941 about firms that allow us to build um, improved synthetic firms, synthetic firms that are based on the real distributions of employees within firms. Also, we're incorporating more detailed administrative data on coverage in the marketplace and um, at an earlier stage, and thus um, allowing us to more accurately reflect, reflect uh, enrollment decisions. Accounting for consumer selection of plans. In the new model, individuals and families are sorted into what we call health insurance units. Um, we do that in both the current and the new model. And they choose health insurance coverage by maximizing expected utility. Uh, this is a change. Our earlier model was based, uh, was an elasticity-based model. The new model is a maxim, uh, expected utility-based model. <clears throat> in our new model, each individual has an imputed health spending distribution, which shows the probability that the individual will spend certain amounts on health care during a year. So instead of average health spending for each individual, we have a whole distribution. Employers decide what coverage to offer, if any, on the basis of their workers' average preferences. Also, co-workers within synthetic firms are sampled from clusters of similar firm types. 
In addition, the, uh, uh, in the marketplace, the new model allows enrollees to select one of three types of plans, bronze, silver, gold. So we're explicitly modeling that choice as we did not before. In the employment-based market, the new models allow firms to offer one of three types of plans, HMO, PPO, or HDHP, on the basis of employee pre preferences. Um, insurance plans are characterized by four parameters in the new model, uh, deductibles, pre-deductible benefits, coinsurance rates, and maximum out-of-pocket payments. That means we can um, bring in new types of products as well. Um, individual health spending distributions allow us to better mod, uh, model products that are medically underwritten. And then final estimates. We always produce final estimates at the national level. But state level regulations, uh, we can model more accurately because CPS data are more representative of states for most states. OK, when will the new model replace the current one? Uh, the new model will be used. Uh, we plan to use the new model to develop our spring 2019 baseline projections and then use it thereafter to um, estimate cost, costs of new proposals. The models, so that's about a year from now, or a little less. The model's current development and testing phase includes study by a technical review panel. We are going to appoint a technical review panel. We are going to be publishing documents about the new model on CBO's website. Uh, we, we will be incorporating feedback during um, um, this process. We are going to do more presentations like this one. Um, and we will keep the current model in operation next year to serve as a point of reference when we bring on board the new model. And how will the new model change CBO's cost estimates? Um, this is a big question. It's too early to tell how the new model will change CBO's cost estimates. In the coming months, we will be testing the new model extensively and comparing it to the current model. Um, at this point, it's too early to tell how they differ. However, the underlying relationships um, among individuals and families between employment income and insurance coverage are different in the new model because our base data are from 2015 rather than 2008. Um, so that may uh, create some differences um, in terms of coverage decisions and budgetary costs. Um, remember that we make technical improvements to all of our models once a year. So uh, uh, this. Uh, Although we're bringing on board a new model, it's not um, going to be that different than our annual updating and revising process, where we bring on board um, new data, new information, and sometimes new methods. Um, the new model also simulates more types of decisions than the current model, so we may see changes due to that feature. Um, it's important to remember that what remains the same under both the current model and the new model is that when we update our models, we continue to rely on the latest available evidence. Uh, the new model, like the current one, will be aligned with the latest available evidence on consumers' and employers' responses to health insurance subsidies. Okay. Hello. Uh, so I'm Alex Minikazi, and Jessica has just nicely reviewed how HiSIM is used in conjunction with other models, either uh, Medicaid enrollment or JCT's tax model, or even additional off model adjustments to produce the baseline coverage estimates and to estimate uh, cost estimates of proposed change to law. Um, she's also talked briefly uh, about some of the details of the new model. I'm going to add some specifics now. HiSIM is a micro simulation model. All micro simulation models have two key components the micro data uh, and the simulation of behavior. 
for the micro data in a health insurance simulation model, you need to observe both individuals and families. Families uh, help decide both what the um, individuals are eligible for in subsidies and what they have access to, perhaps through uh, uh, employer insurance. Um, in addition, there are some key variables that the microdata needs to have, uh, such as income, health status, employment status, and insurance coverage. Once you have the microdata, uh, the key part now is to simulate behavior. And uh, as before, the new model is going to use the theoretical and empirical research to structure those simulations of how those individuals and families would respond to changes in incentives, either through economic conditions or changes in law. As Jessica mentioned, the base data are from the CPS. We chose the CPS because it has uh, several advantages. Um, obviously, we prefer to have data now collected uh, post-ACA. Um, the CPS happens to be a large, fairly representative data set for the US. Uh, we're focused on the non-institutionalized population. We have other models to look at uh, the institutionalized. And um, the CPS has reasonably reliable, timely information about income, health status, employment status, and insurance coverage, those, those key variables that we discussed. However, the CPS is imperfect, and we need to make some adjustments to the microdata. So we know, for example, that Medicaid coverage uh, tends to be undercounted, people misreport. Um, even firm size is not well reported in the CPS. And remember that the number of employees at your firm can affect the firm's uh, decision to offer because they can, uh, for larger firm sizes, uh, spread those administrative costs better and have uh, a more stable risk pool. Um, Self-employment income is notoriously uh, uh, underreported, particularly losses. On survey data, we have tax data that we can uh, align. We, we, it's a much higher quality uh, data source. And while the CPS asks whether uh, the, your employer offers insurance, it does it at the time of the survey, uh, while the income information, the family information is all in the prior year. And so we need to edit uh, uh, that variable slightly. Sorry, go back. <laughs> so um, then there are variables that are important that are completely missing, and we're going to impute them uh, based on the variables that we do observe, and again, a higher quality source for those uh, uh, key variables. So as Jessica mentioned, um, we need to know uh, what the employer offers, whether it's an HMO, uh, uh, PPO or HDHP, and we need to assign the plan characteristics, the deductibles, the coinsurance, maximum out of pockets, and so forth. Um, and we also need to know how much the employer contributes because that affects their decision of whether to offer or not, and it affects the employee's decision of whether to take up that offer. Uh, and so we're going to use uh, MEPS IC data um, to, to help us with that, and I'll talk about that more in a bit. Um, Marginal tax rates, uh, adjusted gross income, all of these have to be imputed onto the CPS. Uh, and then because this is an expected utility model, the health spending distribution is very important. Uh, different types of insurance coverage will uh, subject to, to more or less out of pocket. Uh, cost for health care for different types of people. And so we use the MEPS HC aligned to the national health account uh, data to um, uh, impute. Okay. So the CPS uh, tells us about workers, but it doesn't tell us about all the co workers that are linked to that worker at that firm. And collectively, that's going to influence both the type of plan that they have offered and uh, whether they have an offer to begin with. And so we're going to construct a synthetic firm. We're going to randomly match co workers to each worker in the CPS. 
And we do it uh, in the new model using this tax data that uh, Jessica alluded to. So every uh, uh, firm is going to uh, file this 941. Uh, we're going to take the universe of W-2s, uh, find all workers that are linked to that 941. We'll exclude some because they were intermittent. They're not going to show up. They're not going to affect the offer decision. Uh, we're going to calibrate, again, to outside sources, make sure uh, the firm size distribution matches. But um, now we're going to have these clusters of firms. So you take someone who is between a certain age range, earnings range, and a firm size range, and you say, oh, uh, they have a probability of being in this cluster, which has uh, an earnings and age distribution of all the coworkers. And so we're going to create this great heterogeneity in the workforce that more aptly describes uh, the actual workforces that we observe. To illustrate this, um, I've given you three workers. Uh, uh, worker one, two, and three are going to come from the CPS, and we're going to need to build synthetic firms around them. And in the old method, uh, we drew this from national compensation survey data, which was quite limited and uh, did not even have age in, in the way we needed. And so we would assign them a distribution from that cell um, and then give some random perturbation to give some variation, because we knew not all firms were going to be the same uh, for a worker, let's say, age 30, uh, earning between 40 and $50,000 in that year. Um, and we did the same thing with earnings, and you get these distributions that look basically normally distributed, a little with some perturbation, um, but, but uh, uh, not a lot of heterogeneity. In the new method, we can have uh, younger earnings, uh, younger people clustered together, just like they tend to do sometimes in firms. Um, we can have firms that are primarily uh, higher earnings workers or firms that are more spread. And this greater heterogeneity will allow us to uh, more accurately model firm responses to changes in incentives, either uh, subsidy in the outside non-group market or, or so forth. OK, so that's all on the micro data and how we build it up. The rest of my talk is going to talk about how we simulate behavior. And so, uh, as Jessica mentioned, um, we're moving to an expected utility-based model. We have a, a variety of plans that they can choose from. We around, uh, allow their utility to be somewhat random. We know that there's a, a heterogeneity, and we want to account for that. But we're going to take each option uh, that they can potentially choose, uh, use the characteristics of the plan, and figure out uh, what they would spend out of pocket for healthcare. And so that out of pocket is going to include their spending on the premium, what they pay for themselves uh, for their health care uh, outside of that. And then, of course, we need to consider subsidies, uh, taxes, and any mandate penalties the employer might have to pay. Right? So um, we have all these monetary factors affecting the utility for each of the options that they can choose. We also acknowledge that risk aversion is an important consideration. So there are perfectly healthy people that don't really expect, uh, uh, with high probability, of having high costs uh, of health care. And yet they purchase insurance because they want to avoid risk. And so we're going to have this utility function. Um, it has lots of parameters embedded in it, describing how much you uh, care about uh, certain characteristics of the plan or uh, certain outcomes. And it will also have a, a, a risk version parameter. We're going to need to estimate each of those parameters or assign the ones that we can't estimate through <coughs> identification of the model. Okay. And so um, uh, the risk aversion parameter, we think there are good estimates in the outside literature. Uh, but some of the other deeper parameters of the utility function, we're going to use our rich data to try to estimate. 
So I talked about uh, the options available to a health insurance unit. So each person in the unit can choose a variety of plans. So if it's a uh, single plan offered by your employer, uh, you get a different utility for a PPO plan than you would for an HMO plan, et cetera. Okay? So now we're allowing for a lot more heterogeneity in plan selection both on uh, the employer side, but also uh, through the tiers of the uh, on-marketplace and off-marketplace non-group market. We need data to help inform all of these things, to help us estimate these parameters. Uh, and so for employment-based, uh, we primarily use the medical expenditure panel survey, the insurance component, the IC, and the household component. On the non-group side, uh, we have some rich data from uh, the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. We also have CMS data and then uh, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners. For the uninsured to get the total number, uh, we um, uh, use the National Health uh, Interview Survey, and then to get the distribution uh, by income and household size among the uninsured, we're going to use the MEPS uh, HC. And then for Medicaid and CHIP, uh, CBO has its own projections, uh, which are based on administrative data that we can use. So that's decision making at the health insurance unit level. <laughs> the employers also make decisions as to whether or not to offer health insurance and which type of plan to offer. And they are going to do so based on uh, several inputs. Um, the advantage of the expected utility model is we have computed the wor each worker's uh, utility from the uh, option of the employer, let's say, offering an HMO and every other possible option available to them. And we can figure out how much more utility that worker gets from that HMO offer relative to the options. And we can sum it overall workers and use that to help inform what type of plan the, the uh, firm is going to offer. So for example, uh, it might be the case that if they have a lot of um, uh, younger uh, but high income workers, uh, the firm might uh, tend towards a high deductible health plan um, uh, over a choice of a PPO or an HMO. right? Um, so, but the employer's decision also depends um, not just on their workers' preferences, but on how much they will contribute to the health plan, their own costs, and then any applicable employer mandate penalties uh, that they might be subject to. So to summarize, uh, the new base data will be the CPS, which is a, a major change. Um, Obviously, we edit the CVS, uh, CPS and we impute a number of key uh, variables. We have a new way of constructing synthetic firms um, that more accurately captures the age heterogeneity uh, uh, amongst and within firms. And um, we simulate the coverage behavior now uh, based on a random utility model with risk aversion. Uh, the parameters in the utility function, uh, we primarily estimate through generalized method of moments. Um, but we do so set some of those uh, based on the outside research literature. And then employers are going to select their coverage based on the preferences of their employees and any uh, payments they need to make for insurance. For more background, uh, you can see some of these uh, publications. Uh, this is our opportunity to um, present these ideas to you. We are hoping for your feedback. Uh, one way, obviously, is to give it today. And we will listen carefully and write things down. Um, but you can also uh, contact our communications department. Um, you can reach them through the uh, uh, CBO website. And um, we're happy to uh, incorporate as much information as we can in the new model. Thank you. <laughs>